What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of A Thinking Man's Podcast. I'm your host. My name is Joseph Percher. With me, as always, my good friend Tommy Styles. Tommy, what's up, buddy? How we doing, man? We're good. Hey. Back, back on it. Back on the regular schedule here. Um, and so we're going to touch on a couple different things today. First, I know you had some some thoughts about this. Um, and some things that you've seen recently. And then also as someone that's coaching people through an upcoming contest season, we're going to discuss common mistakes or mistakes in general that we see in contest prep. So without any further ado, Tommy Styles, the floor is yours, my friend. Yeah, we kind of touched on <clears throat> common uh, nutritional mistakes in a recent yeah. episode. Um, I think the Biggest point I wanted to make is that not all contest preps are the same. You know, some people have to starve. Some people get to be fed more food. The perception of hunger is different from one person to the next. Like, I would be stoked to feel the hunger that I I have clients describe to me. I just, I don't, I don't have it, but uh, I have to eat a lot of food for my desired goal and where I'm at, um, how much muscle I carry, et cetera. So the point I'm getting at is like, as a client, if you're working with a coach and if you're a coach listening to this and you're working with clients, don't be scared to push people low calorically. Like it just might be necessary. Like I just had a case where I was lowering a client's calories. He's four weeks out from his first show. And I was like, wow, this this looks miserable. And I had to remember that like, this is contest prep. This is, you're doing something that the human body wasn't designed to do. And it's not supposed to be enjoyable. The, the reward is sticking to something and maintaining the discipline and getting to that through that end date that you set out to get to, you know, 16, 18, 20 weeks out, maybe longer. Um, And everyone you know, refeeds get talked about and cheat meals. And it's like, he he hasn't had one because yeah. he started in a place with me where we didn't have that option. And we still don't. Um, the fear of being flat. And I noticed now with all the talk, our podcast included about these things that people who don't have several preps under their belt, who just who haven't, who don't understand it as well as others, they almost think these things are like a rite of passage. Like, well, I get to prep, so I get to refeed, or I get to, I get to, if I go six days low carb, I get to have a higher carb day on day seven. Yeah. None of you need to remove all expectations because what I see a lot of right now is people trying to basically get around having to go through the hardest part of prep. And that's usually the very end. If you've done it right. Like I would say, those last four weeks time starts to crawl because you're never not hungry. You, you eat a meal, you finish your last bite. You're instantly thinking about the next meal and you, you have three hours to fill until you get to, to go through that same feeling again. And I think we, I don't think contest prep is about suffering, but it, there is some suffering that happens because if this is your first time doing it, second time doing it, or you're just someone who has to push things really low to get in shape based off your genetic disposition and the individual factors that go with you, like it, it might suck. It might be suffering something. And you, you're not an asshole if you call it suffering. I mean, you can, I think glorifying it and talking about it on social media too much kind of is overplayed, but also like, there was a prep I had in 2017 where, I mean, for three weeks, I, every single thing I did sucked. Like driving to the store, I had to sit in my car before getting out. After I got back to the car, I had to sit there before I drove away. Like you're just on like, it's almost like you're on rewind, but you're living in life. Um, and that just may be how life goes because of the goal you've set out to do. And I think in today's climate, we would see a client complain about having to feel like that. And a coach for fear of maybe losing the client would cave to the demands of the client. Like, okay, let's, let's have a refeed or, okay, let's, let's uh, use these hunger hacks. Like 
I've never provided my clients with any ways of hacking hunger other than the hunger that you're feeling is what you need to go through to get to your goal. Blast through it, run through adversity, not around it. Um, the, the totality of what you can take from what a contest pro prep provides for your character building lies in sticking that stuff out. I, I remember my very first prep. It was the hardest I had ever worked towards something for 16 weeks or whatever. And the result meant fuck all because of the mental strength I gained going through that. Um, and I just, you know, I, I just see it around my area. There's a couple coaches who are in the effort to produce content. They're trying to provide ways for competitors to prep while not feeling hungry. And I just, I think you create a, a bigger issue by just not accepting your reality of you are probably going to be starving but the thing about the word starving is I bet if I proposed to someone who told me they were starving, okay, you can eat, but you have to go eat food out of the trash can. You wouldn't eat it. So you're not actually starving. You're just focused on food. It's just all about up here. And that's what you get to condition and strengthen with a contest prep. And, you know, we, we talk, we talk to a lot of older guys who are OGs on this podcast that we've had as guests. And, you know, Andrew Barry comes to mind and he said he went 32 days without a carb. And that's a guy that's, he's not a small guy. That's a big dude having to do that to get in the necessary yeah. condition to be competitive. And like, yeah, you're a 160 pound little ass can't go a week without fucking carbs because you'll go flat. Like get out of here with that shit. That's my, yeah, rant. yeah, no, that's, it's a good start. Um, a couple, a couple thoughts or just themes that I picked up on as you're speaking that I want to reiterate. One of them being is that people get into this and sign up, especially if they're have having a goal or hiring a coach for the purpose of getting them on a bodybuilding stage. You have to understand the gravity of the decision you just made. This is an extreme fucking thing. Like 3% yeah. body fat for males, if that's like, we're talking male bodybuilders, even classic, um, we're talking about being 3 or 4% body fat. You're going to look fucking wild. You're The goal is that you are going to look crazy compared to the average person and even crazy to the other competitors on stage should be the goal. So why are we to think that the process to get this outrageous result would not be as equally outrageous it, it's going to be extreme it's going to be the craziest most difficult thing that you've ever done you are going to have moments that you feel like your body is not capable of moving another inch or moving another rep or taking another step on the stairs and then you're going to do it and it's going to change your life in terms of what your mind is capable of and what you come to expect from yourself. But you're damn right. There's an element of suffering to this. Maybe it's not to the degree of some of like, you know, the terrible humanity things that we know go on across the world or what have you. Um, but essentially a, a controlled starvation to exotically low levels of body fat is absolutely going to require a certain level of suffering. It's not a suffering contest. It's not diet your face off and show up as just the skinniest, most ripped lean person there. That's not what it's about. Um, but if there is no degree of suffering, especially if we're talking about enhanced male bodybuilding, if there is no degree of suffering at all, like whether it's extreme hunger and food focus or whether it's just extreme fatigue. That's always my biggest thing in prep more so than being hungry is that I just can't, it feels like I cannot move. Um, mm -hmm. And so yeah. you, you have to, if there is not a degree of any of those things, well, then there's a very good chance that you're not going to be in shape. And that's really the, the entire essence of show, bodybuilding. Any local show you could go sit as a spectator and, if you've been in this a while, you can just look on stage and you can see who didn't suffer and who, who did their homework. Did just just yeah. at first glance. 100%. Yeah. 
Yeah, you see it right away. It becomes very obvious. You could see it in somebody's face. You could see it in the texture of their muscle and their skin. Like um, you can see it. And because you're there in person, it's even more obvious than it is on Instagram or, you know, any of these social media platforms. Because when you're there in person and you see someone 3D moving in action and they're peeled, you see it the moment they step out from behind the curtain and walk across the stage. Um, you can see when somebody is peeled immediately. And that's really what you should be shooting for. So knowing, uh, I think almost I, as we talk through this, I almost wonder if part of this has been um, like the glorification of mediocrity, mostly on social media. Like so many people I see that post stage photos get 600 likes and 400 comments of people saying they killed it. They're ripped. They're peeled can't believe that you didn't win what were the judges looking at and the photos are mediocre at best most of the time these are people that were not in true stage conditioning and then they still get that type of reinforcement and gratification so then other people see that let's say an entire audience of people see someone get all of these remarks and engagement and all these things from a very mediocre stage look that's all they're going to come to expect from their, from themselves. Then that's a standard then that they're okay with. So they're not willing to go to the end of the earth because the result is not that extreme to them because they've just come to accept mediocrity. So um, I think that's a, I think that's an issue with it as well. Um, And then also probably the biggest component is mm. uh, the mediocrity. Cause if, if you have only yes men in your camp, then, you will never rise above what their level is. Typically, yes men are mediocre type people. So yeah. that's it does play a role. Um, social media also creates the culture of people thinking they know how prep it like prep is not black and white, but at the end of the day, like it's it is in a sense of like you're gonna do more cardio you're going to do eat less food and eat less try to maintain your training and train as hard as you can like that's that's what i wish people would really look at the chance to do in contest prep is just work harder than you've ever worked in your life even if you've prepped before like i'm going into a prep and i still have that desire within me to like man i just want to kick fucking ass through my show dates this year like that's all i want to do Fuck the placing, fuck the, you know, whether I, I'm full or this body part's improved. Or like at the end of the day is the most simple process I could think of. I just want to work really hard and know that I did that by the day before the show. And then I can sit there, get tan. Usually, man, if you really do it right, you there's going to be a point at about a week out that there's still work to be done. But at a certain moment, maybe after your last meal on the Monday before the show, Man, I've had some moments where I kicked my feet up and I was like, I just fucking murdered this shit from start to finish for an extended period of time. Like there's a lot of pride in doing something that other people would have folded. Yeah. And other people, I mean, at this point, the way the world's going, like we're talking like 99% of the people would fold. Like most people can't even follow it. It's truly like a 99.9 type situation if we're talking about everybody. 100%. Because, I mean, what you're willingly putting yourself through, like we talk about world starvation is like, those people aren't going to the gym and performing. They're just starving and they're living. They're just in trying power. to survive. Yeah. Different variables. Um, yeah, yeah. But like, you, you, it's calculated starvation, but you're also you still have to perform. You still have a job to perform. You may have like kids that you're that are. You may have people dependent on you to show up still. Like there's a lot that you're taking on to do this thing as well. Um, And we kind of have veered away from, but like you just can't, there are no rules. You can't be like, there are no rules. And then also it almost feels like there's a super low. They may need to go super low, but also I feel like there's a lack of respect for the process. Like we were just like you were just mentioning all these external factors. Like if you have all this stuff going on, like bodybuilding, let's not get it twisted. Bodybuilding is a luxury to be able to do this and afford this and do this at a high level every day. It's a complete luxury that you've been able to tailor your life 
so that you could fit in this all-consuming hobby of yours. So if you're someone that bodybuilds and then you have all these other external factors, you run a business, you have a job, you have a family, you have kids, uh, you know, any of these other things, you coach your kids soccer, any of this stuff, like you need to be prepared that you just added the biggest stress that you're ever going to encounter on top of your day-to-day -day routine. So it's going to take like a superstar effort from you to juggle and manage all of it. Like no questions aside, you're about to put yourself through a period that will take more effort and time management and like dedicated, dedicated, um, just effort towards nailing all of it and being excellent at all of it. It's going to be one of the most difficult periods of your life. If you're one of these people that has all these external factors. So there needs to be a respect for that process, both in terms of like we were talking about earlier, what the standard is that you are expecting from yourself at the end. Um, because whatever that standard is that you are expecting for yourself is going to dictate how well you execute on a day-to-day -day basis. If you don't expect that much from yourself, you're not going to do that much. Um, but then also setting up the process, like having a respect for the process to where you set it up. So all these other th things in life are facilitating you being your best at the most important part of your year as a competitive bodybuilder. Yeah, and we, I mean, we, there's tons of different variables we could run through to tell people how to set yourself up, but it's so individually specific that it's, I just... Yeah, to your point, there is no rules. You're right. Like, the, like the, the main thing that you were bringing up earlier was like, man, all these people are trying to sell this golden ticket of here's here come come sign up for my contest prep and you're never going to be hungry and you're going to eat all the food and we're going to get you shredded. And it's like... Man, that's not anybody, even with the length of prep. I see so many people that like are like, oh, I want to, I want, you know, hey, uh, can I hire you? I want to do a show in 12 weeks. And it's like, whoa, like, man, you're so far off from doing this. Like, one, like this, we can do it in 12 weeks and it would be a fucking wreck and it would be miserable on your end. Um, or if you just give yourself enough time, you set yourself up so much better. So that's another thing, too. Like, yeah. It, it, you know, if you try to do 20 weeks of work in 12 weeks, you're going to have to, that's going to be an even more extreme process. So if you sign up and know that that's your circumstance, Hey, I'm signing up for a fucking 12 week shotgun prep. Well, then you more than anybody need to be prepared for a brutal process. Like that's an extreme result to try to get in 12 weeks. So the yeah. process is going to be fucking extreme, even in 20 David weeks. David Goggin shit to want to do that. Yeah. Like that's, <laughs> Yeah. That's sadist type. And like, if you're not, which I don't think those people are, I think they those just people have like are a fleeting not. thought of, oh, I want to do a show. It's an emotional thing. They have something, yeah. they're trying to fill some other type of void in their life quickly. Yeah. And I've, I've, uh, I know I've done that myself. I've yeah, done that myself. Yeah. That's uh, absolutely. How we, can, we can tell you that it's not the way to go. Yeah. No, those are the, those are the preps that I had that were probably most chaotic I didn't look any different from the year before because I didn't take the time in between to plan things out and really grow. Yeah, I've done, we've done it all, man. I've made, that's, I feel like that's the biggest reason we have enough to talk about to even keep this show going is that we're just talking about all the stuff that we fucked up along the way. That's all this is. I feel like the biggest thing was like, let me get on here and anybody that's listening, I'm just going to impart all the mistakes that I've made and if you hear this and figure out another way to do it, you might get to your goals quicker than I did. Yeah. That's paying it forward. Is like, yeah, we, we walked a path and we're trying to, but I can honestly say never in my time have I been like scared to eat le less than like, I, I actually, no, get, I like, always welcome it. I get fired up when a coach. Yeah. Hell yeah. Yeah. Like, Cause in my mind, and this is from the very beginning, that means that what I set out to do is becoming closer because right. oh, we're pulling carbs now, if that was happening, whatever the case may be. And I'm like, fuck yeah, that means I'm going to get peeled. And I, I always looked at that or getting more cardio. Like I Same. think if you're the type of person and you open your update and your coach has increased your cardio by five minutes a session, or he's pulled the sweet potatoes out of meal five or whatever. And your first reaction is that you're sad or depressed or you want to complain or about offended it. Yeah, yeah yeah like this this isn't for you because that should yeah. actually like in turn let you know that 
we're, we're turning things up another level because contest prep is supposed to elevate as it goes on. Like, Hey, it's getting harder. Hey, it's getting harder. Hey, it's getting harder. And with me from the very first time I ever did it, it was just like, this is awesome. I want more of this. Yes. And yeah. put it on me. I can do more. I've, we've talked about it, man. Like, you know, we're the type of guys that we would have coaches that would get pissed. I've had coaches that would be pissed where they were like, dude, I know you could do more cardio. I've I, every time I'm checking in, I'm like, Hey, here's, here's the weight. Here's the picks. Here's the feedback. Could do more cardio could do without some of these carbs. Like I yeah. always looked at it like, Oh, okay. These changes are going to be the changes that bring my physique to the next level now. And that's, you know, in regards to the whole point of this, like food, you can't work with a coach who's never gone insane as far as how low they push their food and, and showing up that they can get the condition because there's a reason they can't guide you on how on, on to that level because they've never walked it. They right. they don't know these these insides, these inside things about what brain function will do and how you'll, you'll have that extreme feeling of fatigue all day. Even if you're getting sleep, you're just unrelenting. Like if I got to walk over there, I'm like, do I really got to walk over there? Like, yeah. Um, yeah. And that's, that's just where it is. So I don't know. I, I just had an instance cause I got a guy prepping right now and he's four weeks out. And I'm like, I know he's, he's not complaining, but I know he's like, in the fields man he's in the thick yeah. of it in the trenches and yeah there's no emotions in contest prep even as a coach there's no emotions like yeah there's no emotions as a client there's no emotions as a coach and all you can do is if you're a coach listening to this is like check on your people reinsure them but understand sure. that there is no other way yeah you know, and as a coach you can't hold their hold their hand through it like at a certain right. point you got to just trust that that guy on the other end of the relationship is just a self-driven crazy motherfucker at the end of it, because that's what it's from that point forward. Yeah. That's what it kind of takes. It takes somebody that's just going to say, I'm fucking doing this. I don't care what comes my way at this point. I've come this far and I'm going to do whatever the fuck it takes. I think at the end of every contest prep, if you did it right, and this is for any competitor, bikini wellness figure, men's bodybuilding, men's physique. Uh, if you did it right and you did everything you were supposed to and you were in the proper condition for your division, you will have a story to tell of what you internally had to overcome during that. Oh, yeah. prep. You don't have to glorify it and tell it on Instagram. I think social media has made us like, oh yeah, we know you were starving and you're, somebody died during the, like, you almost like overlook these things because you see it so much, but like yeah. if, if I'm close to you during your prep and you're telling, I know certain things about what you went through. Like, I'm going to know that like, damn, Joe just worked his ass off. Yeah. Whether the whole fucking world knows it because of social media or not, that doesn't matter. Like, you know it, your close people in your camp know it. Yeah. The people that that's, matter know. That's all that matters. Like that's so I, but you, can't have that if you didn't do it right if you just got on shape right. looking like you're eight weeks out you don't have a story because you ran away from all of those points that are going to give you a story to talk about because you were scared yeah um, yeah it's like that path of of most resistance or the least right. resistance depending on which one you choose um uh, yeah man that's uh hearing that you have that client right now that that's at that point it's sick but i'm almost like hearing that i'm almost like jealous of that being in that mode you know what i mean like that oh, I'm, uh, I'm in it i'm in it with him because like yeah. i'm sending him texts throughout the day that are like i'm because i'm a, i mean anybody that listens to this and you know me like i'm fucking like i was like we're gonna punk people at the weigh-ins when you strip down like this is the, i need you to lean into this right now i need you to gnaw on your fist because when it's time to show what you've done you're going to win and yeah, like hell yeah i think that's my my niche as a coach is to kind of like not cheerly but also like you just have to go this is this is the obstacle or the there's a marcus Aurelius quote i've used and i'm blanking on it right now but the obstacle in the path becomes the path. Like you just have to ram through this hunger and this feeling of like anxiousness and just lean into it. There's yeah. no other way. And he knows that. Yeah. And like, 
you know, when you work with people who, who dig what your mentality is, then, you know, it just synergistically, everything lines up, but at the end of the day, there's no sugarcoating it. Like this, this isn't fun. Yeah. It, it It's the reward of what you get from sticking to something you set out to do is the, the fun of it, but the day to day and like, there's no glory there, man. It sucks. Yeah. No, we get, you get, you know, like roughly like four to six minutes up on stage to, for it to be fun or for you to show what you've been working on. Like, um, and like we've talked about a lot of times in bodybuilding, a lot of us don't even like necessarily being on stage. Um, but I, I, that's one thing I, I would say, try to, for people that are listening that are competing or getting ready for a show, that's a good time to try to be present and try to embrace that that's your time to show it because it's, you've had this entire run of, you know, 16, 20, 24 weeks, of just um, nailing it and finding solutions to all these little day-to-day things day after day um, without really any fanfare or anything. So it's, that's a big part of, I think um, the enjoyment or the reward quote unquote is uh, I've always thought about like the reward at the end of contest prep is just the photos that you get back of yourself. Not so much even like a placing. Um, that's why I always tell because it just speaks for itself like if you're dug out like we were saying before like if you get photos where you know you're you turn around and squeeze your glutes and your hamstrings and pull back for you know and you have a wild ass Christmas tree that's undeniable to everybody that's there and everybody that sees it then I won as far as I'm concerned like that was what I got in this to do yeah no I mean even I got a message I got a message from a guy that it was not that didn't that I didn't know prior to my last show. And he was just there. He was there with a group of friends for a different friend. And he found me on Instagram after and sent me a message and was like, dude, I sat up in the front and could not believe what your hamstrings and your glutes looked like. And I was, you know, it's it's cool. I probably didn't get into it all that much with the guy, but it has stuck out. I mean, that was almost two years ago at this point, and it has stuck out me ever since. I felt like that guy just handed me whatever philosophical trophy I would have needed. Like that was this personification of what I've set out to do. Yeah. It's a sign of respect. I mean, for sure. That's kind of what, you know, years and of doing this and chasing it is uh, it, it kind of lets you, you see a guy or you see a girl who you can tell has like been in the thick of it for years. And you almost just want to like, Hey man, I, I, know where, I know where you've been. Like Turner and I talk yeah. about that all the time. Like we were actually talking last night and he was just like, there's only a handful of motherfuckers in the world who will spill food on the floor and then eat it off the floor. Cause they don't want to miss. And I'm like, that's fucking, that's it, dude. Like, yeah. That is it. It. yeah. And someone listening to this is like, Oh, that's gross. Why would you eat food off the floor? And it's like, you, you don't get it. Yeah. You don't get <laughs> you it. Don't get it. Like you haven't been in enough of those scenarios to know like that. It's kind of a no brainer actually. And it just, it is what it is. Yeah. Um, like, if I forgot a fork, like there's no other option other than to eat with my hands. Like, yeah, yeah. I, I don't, it never even occurred to me to ask somebody if that was the way to go when I was younger. Like, <laughs> yeah. I'm just going to do it. Yeah. So. See, that's the one thing, man. These guys now, I think because everything is, we're so accessible and all this information is so accessible. And they need their handheld for all, of, like, they need to be told that, yes, this next action is okay to take. Whereas for us, it was kind of, it was so hands-off. It was just, here's a plan and then go out into the world and figure it out how this fits within your own circumstance and just come back to me at the end of the week when you've done it all. Like not a new email every day. Hey, uh, what about my uh, my blood glucose was 91 today? Uh, hey, what about this? I felt a little uh, digestive issue. Like no, there was none of that. Like it was just, hey, I'm just going to go bodybuild and follow this plan. Um and I'll see you in a week. And like, uh, I'm proud to say that we offer a higher level than that now, but also it's, it's just almost crippled some of these guys. And I've talked about that a, a little bit here recently on the last couple of shows, but I just want to see more people just be about bodybuilding, like just be about the action, like just go live it. And then we'll talk about it at the end of the week. Yeah. I mean, Ron, uh, big Ron said that on our show, like we, you know, in his time, it was like they got too fat or as an example. And then now it's like guys are afraid to put on any size. And it's like the pendulum got swung way too far. We've made coaching a lot better and we're covering more aspects of the overall process. But also 
we've created a huge facet for paralysis by analysis mm. and with with step count blood glucose blood pressure I blood know. work like man like yeah, health is important but it, it's an extreme endeavor it's it extreme. a very extreme endeavor it's extreme natural, natural or not like getting contest lean for any division is an extreme endeavor yeah and so because of that, the process, like we said, the process should be fucking super wild and extreme. Um, now, on contest prep, I don't know. Do you want to talk about your prep at all? No, we're, I know we're still quite a ways out, 20 plus weeks out here, but maybe setting the uh, setting the stage for where you're at for people to follow along. Yeah. I mean, I'm I put still, him on the spot. I, Tommy wasn't prepared for this. Tommy would Tommy would ghost the whole prep if it was up to him. I would. Uh, there is a as far as like the X's and O's of prep. That's that's no, you know, it is what it is. Like, I think because I live my whole year like I'm in prep. There's really no grand transition no i know that but where how many weeks like what's what's going on what's what's the goal what's, I, what's the show? 20, 20 plus um, 20 plus weeks i think i don't i don't know when it starts i mean dom dom calls the shot so 16 to 18 weeks out i would assume like prep starts yeah but i'm and that's still dom dom cardone that you're working with yeah um, yeah we uh, do um, vegas multiple doms um, yeah um as far as food, I mean, I've, this is the most food I've eaten for this long of a period without digestion issues. Um, mm. Okay. You know, from April, 2022 to now, like it's just been consistently north of 5,000 calories on yeah. uh, my training days and then non-training days is like 35 to 3,700. Oh, so pretty good, dip, pretty good dip. Yeah. And that that's really helped my appetite at least stay present. Um, and I've learned a lot, you know, with nutrition with Dom. Like that's almost like a uh, like a Phil Viz slash Justin Harris type method. Those guys yeah. are big on that uh, as two examples, um, where they intentionally. It's almost like you're you're digging out more carbs that you uh, carbs and food that you can be sensitive to on those training days and by bringing it back on rest days, which is something yeah. I've done. I've used that with different clients, but they, I, I, I have seen it. And then in your, your case, it's such an extreme example of how much food is on the high end of training days. It's uh, I thought that's an interesting, uh, an interesting thing to note. Yeah. It's been really helpful as far as, you know, not, I shouldn't say not being miserable because I mean, it sucks. Eating is definitely a chore for me, but when do you get hungry? At what point will you start to feel hunger? 10 weeks out, eight weeks out. I don't know. Yeah. In years past though, I mean, when, like, when do you, what's, what's typical for you? And then are you somebody eight weeks and then is it food focus or are you actually hungry? Because right now, I'll tell you, for me, a big mental Speed hurdle. Speed I can eat is like, I can just fucking mow. Food focus is almost more of a bigger issue for me than physical, in my stomach, hunger. Like, I just like to think about food all day, every day. And I start thinking about shit that's not on my plan, shit that I want. And that's just how my brain works. And so then that's more of a mental hurdle of like, I would love to eat a fucking burger and fries right now instead of this small chicken and rice meal. Um, but I the physical that's... hunger is like never it's, it's always just signified to me that shit was working. So I was like, this is cool. Yeah. I think, uh, I definitely probably get some of that, but I, I don't, it's never like so strong that it affects me. Um, yeah. Oh, it doesn't affect my actions. I'm just, yeah, I'm dreaming about eating fucking yeah. cakes and snacks and shit. I wake up at a at a sleep all sweaty and I'm like, I felt like I just ruined my prep. I think because I've had so many digestion issues that like I can yeah. I associate that with like off plan food. So it's like, yeah. yeah, that looks cool, but what's that gonna do to me? 
Yeah. So that's, that's just a personal experience, but yeah. um, I would say getting, you know, I'm, I'm training four days a week and I plan to keep it that way all through prep. Um, yeah. I've toggled between training six out of every eight days and then four out of every seven, all of 2022. And then now I'm back to the four day split. Um, that seems to be the best for my recovery as far as making sure my knee can withstand leg training um, and then recovery of everything else too. So I can push the volume a little bit higher in each session, knowing I have a lot of off days in between kind of like the Dorian approach. Yeah. Just more volume than he ran. Um, yeah. And so legs is once every seven days then on a set day. Legs. As far as quads, I do hams twice a week. Yeah, yeah. I, I have a, a leg curl and a pull movement on my back day. Yeah. And that that setup allows everything to stay. You know, I'm always like anxious to train on the day of training. But like, you know, I just I trained two days in a row coming into the day. And I was like, after legs yesterday, I was like, I am so glad I don't have to train tomorrow. Yeah. And then already today, it's like in my mind, I'm like, oh shit, I get to train tomorrow. That's awesome. Yeah. So it's there's no burnout, there's no issue. Yeah, recovery is in a good spot. I just think being able to start, and this is what I try to preach to my clients, is like, man, you want to start your prep eating the most food you've ever eaten in in semi respectable condition, and you you're setting the tone for your prep. I just know that, like, I also have to be careful. I don't want to tell myself that there's some point in my prep that I'm going to be hungry because Right. I'm starting at such a high food point that for me and the way I am with hunger, it, it just might not happen, but I have to just eat. Yeah. That was what I happened in 2021. I wasn't, I was expect, I put like a timeline. I was like, once prep starts, I'll be hungry. Everything gets better when I'm hungry. And it, it really wasn't happening. Food was having to stay higher. So mm. I think in 27, like I took so many years off between competing that I just created this huge increase in what it takes for me yeah, to you created like a new set point. Yeah. Yeah. So, and that's, that's just is what it is. Like in a perfect world, I would love to starve because that's kind of my, that's yeah. my happy place, but that's not going to bring me the best physique. Right. Yeah. And like you've put on a good amount of like new muscle tissue. So it's like all of that food that you're going to be able to eat and prep goes towards holding that and upholding your gym performance. Mm -hmm. Um, and then one note too, like you were saying, I think it's a great point that you want to be eating at like a peak off season total prior to starting to prep so that you end up like, there's going to be a ton of food that has to come out, but if a ton comes off a fuck ton of food, you're still eating a good amount at the end. I would make the same comparison or consideration when it comes to like your work capacity and your training volume too it should be at like when your off season is at its peak food is at its peak peds are at its peak training volume intensity workload all these other things should be at it at its peak as well um, because at certain points in prep your volume is going to have to come down in in order to uphold the performance of the sets that you are doing um I think but, people underestimate how low it needs to come too. If you're as far as training volume, like, I mean, three, three to six sets, even like for us. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah. Like, uh, but there is no, I, I will say I'm probably my last prep. One, one thing that I learned is I went low thinking like, Oh, I, I can maintain, you know, certain body parts just on very, very low volume. Um, and I made a mistake for which body part, like I did that for body parts that weren't great. Like I did that for my arms. I did that for my shoulders. And it's like, man, I think having volumes, having a, a, a adequate amount of volume to, to run in contest prep is a benefit. Like, I think those body parts will look bigger and fuller. The more that you train them, I'm not saying go all of a sudden, go do 30 sex sets for arms. Um, but the more you can keep in for certain body parts, I think the better. Um, so being at like a really high work capacity, what, how much work can you handle at the peak of your off season? It gives you more to play with. Like if you know, for example, you're coming down, like your back is 
fucking killer, Tommy. So knowing that like you essentially don't have to do that much, like you are absolutely at the end of your contest prep holding your back on four to six sets a week. And it's like knowing that then you probably can handle a little bit more on body parts that you really want to maintain your legs or your chest, whatever the case is. Um, so just, uh, just a, a, a thought and something that I re reminded myself of from the last contest prep that I thought was a mistake was, was probably getting too like pushing that theory that, Hey, it probably takes way less than we expect for training volume to uphold what we have, especially when you're on PEDs. And I agree. I think it, you can hold muscle on a pretty minimal amount of volume, but also I think I just crossed the line and went too far testing it, like seeing how little I could get away with. Um, so that's a, that's a mistake I think I made. Yeah. I, uh, I think for me, it's what I really want to going into the prep. My thoughts with training volume are because I did make changes in, March of 22 in my off season up until now of where I, I don't do just strictly top set back offset. Like some exercises are programmed to where it's two sets, same amount of reps, say eight to 10, two sets of eight to 10. I don't go up weight until I can get both sets for 10 reps with quality form and then I'll bump load. So in thinking of like going into contest prep, it's like at some point I'm ready to drop off one of those sets of that exercise as needed if it means holding a certain level of strength for overall. Yeah. So I think because of what I did in my off season, getting away from like, cause I I've been a lot stronger on every movement I do currently that I'm posting. Like I've been much stronger as far as the loads I've used. I just recalibrated everything, added in a bit more volume, ma made volume a way to progress instead of just yeah. strictly load. And it's helped my physique as far as holding more fullness and a different yeah. look. And it's also helped with injuries. Um, yeah. I, I made a post yesterday about this. And longevity. Like we've, we yeah. talked about, I remember making this point to each other probably over a year ago where it's like, man, I want to do this for the next 10 years. Yeah. But I also like, we have a lot of younger listeners, like that's not for you. Like if you're yeah. under, yeah. under seven years of training experience, truly like, you probably need less volume than you're doing and you just need to focus on strength. Um, yeah. And the last, I would say that was first like five to seven five, years for sure. Five. Yeah. Five to seven should not like, you should be in there still just clanging and banging and training your ass off. That should be more the thought. Yeah. I've definitely, uh, that's been a lot of my feedback lately to some of my younger guys is just like, Hey, I need you to actually to the, a guy recently, I said, I need you to train like an animal, but don't be a meathead. Mm. And that was like, don't do stupid shit. Like one rep maxes, but right. Also don't be so focused on total control of like, there is a little bit of like, how do you like, how do you tell someone to train a little bit like Branch Warren, but don't? I was just gonna say, I've yeah. told my clients on certain movements, just just go in and be Branch Warren. Yeah, the upper like, back grows if, if the setup is right. Like, yeah, like these little these little lat exercises that we do have their place and they're accurate and pretty slow and controlled. But man, like if you get into like a good chest supported fucking upper back row and like. You just need to let your back stretch under a fuck ton of load and then do everything that you can to drive it up. Like I've said that to my clients, like some movements you want to be super accurate. Some movements you just need to be branch Warren and just let it fucking rip. Yeah. And I, I still, to this day, I champ, I have that ability to flip that switch. Cause like some days I go in there and it's like, I'm not filming anything. It's all music today. Fucking m and show 2004 and I am fucking everyone is going to look at me because I'm making a scene not necessarily being an asshole but I'm training that hard today yeah yeah it's a, it's a good one that that's my uh I'll go in and just blare some fucking limp biscuit if I'm if I'm having a day like that and just have them scream in my ear yeah. for an hour and a half see that's 
I've, I've realized that I've gotten older, like there's certain screaming that like, there's a level where I get anxiety. I'm like, this is too much. So, oh, for sure, dude. And have you ever gone through, like been through, like say you're two thirds of a way through a brutal leg workout and now the headphones just permanently have to come out. I don't know if that's a weird thing, but I so often I will get through like two thirds of my leg workout. And then for whatever reason, at a certain point, I'm like, I just can't do the headphones anymore. Like, it's just too much. I don't know if it's like an anxiety thing or uh, a lack of an attention span or what, but I'm like, this is just too much for me to focus on. Like, I need to get through this. You do those, the AirPods? Yeah. Yeah, so do I. I used to, back in the day, I had the uh, Beats by Dre, the boom. Me too. I always felt like I I always made it a point, no matter what was going on in my life, if I was starting a contest prep, I was getting myself a new pair of the studios that would fully encapsulate your entire ear. And it was like, I'm going in, I'm going to war. Like I'm going into my own world and I'm fucking doing this shit. Now we poke fun at people that kind of use that shit. And it's like, oh, we're going to war, brother. Like, yeah. Um, you know, but that was, that was my mentality. Like that's how I thought about things. So um, whatever, whatever it takes to, to get yourself to do what you need to do. I mean, I think social media has given people the ability to broadcast what, mm. you know, years ago, we just kept to ourselves. And that was that, like, you didn't have to like, yeah, have a reel with some fucking Machiavelli motivation montage. Know, to it. Like, yeah. You just, you did that on your own. No, you just put, you just played that Machiavelli video in your ears and just yeah. did whatever you needed to do. And nobody knew, but like only you knew that you just did what you needed to do. Yeah, exactly. And I, I think that's why it gets such a, a stain on it now, because it is a tool. It is a tool. Like you have to be your own quote unquote motivation. It is a tool to, to derive things from, but the broadcasting of it and like the lengths people are willing to go to like, show everybody how hard they work it's just kind of where everyone's just like like they just watched a soap opera when they see shit like that so yeah but we're all doing it i mean even me like i will there are so many different things that i have a a connection to even songs like um there's a reason probably where i can't get into new rap it's because oh yeah man, Dude. 12 year old tommy was banging the eminem show <laughs> Rocking the same shit. This exactly. man was this man was fucking killed when I was three years old. I'm still listening to his music. Yeah. Oh man, I've been on a NWA Ice Cube kick. Like, oh, I, shit. I, wow, you're going dark, huh? Okay. Like, I just like sometimes I like violence. A lot of times I yeah. don't like words, but yeah. sometimes I go in there and I'm like, let's talk about murder today. <laughs> yeah, yeah. NWA, man, that's a that's a solid place to go when you're in that type of mode. Um but all right, man, what else do we have? Can we kind of get off the rails? So contest prep. Um we've talked about going super low in food and you know kind of just what to expect from the process. Um any other points that you wanted to touch up maybe on contest prep, your own prep, um general mistakes that you see or anything that you kind of want to f- kind of wrap up with in my own prep if there's a way i can uh document it that provides value is just uh i want to touch on psychological stuff throughout the duration of it yeah and we want to hear it in the group yeah the facebook group is where i'll cover a lot of it so again if you're not over there man we didn't even talk about it at all at thinking the beginning. man's thinking man's podcast on the facebook private yeah. group request to join as long as you don't look like a it doesn't matter what you look like no we're all degenerates it doesn't matter what what you look like just respect the space i don't know your profile picture determines a lot (laughs) no you're good you guys come on in it's it's a it's actually we've had some good conversations so far so yeah it's been good it's been cool Uh, and then uh, basically derived an entire episode out of the questions from from the group itself so that's cool um But yeah, I, I just want to touch on cycle, like as it's happening for me, I'll kind of relay it to there and then, you know, on different episodes as it applies to whatever we're putting out. But, uh, you know, contest prep is set up in your off season. So any, but like, I see it, we see it every year where people just, 
they they sign up with a coach 12 to 16 weeks out and that coach has no fucking clue what they've been doing what they've done what any issues they've like yeah, they're gonna respond they haven't been able to fix anything like right you know i i uh in respect to myself like dom's had me for nine months now so he's right. been able to build my calories he's been able to see me through a cycle see my blood work a couple times see that i'm in a really good spot with blood work starting prep and i can't tell you how invaluable that is to like hormonally and and blood marker wise be and I have a clear runway because it just sets the tone up here like we talk about this being extreme you're taking there's risks with your health if you're going on the extreme end and that's a decision i have no problem making but it's backed up by the fact that I, I keep improving my blood work as I'm going deeper into this, as I'm getting bigger, as I carry more weight. Um, you know, if I saw things that were like issues, then I have a decision to make. Like, man, can I really start a contest prep? Right. And if I do, what at what cost? I don't have that. So, you know, you point is, is just like give a coach at least six months to work with you before you start a prep. That way, everything can be, you know, properly aligned. Yeah, you can hit the ground running, man. There's a million different reasons for it. They can dial in your programming in terms of your training, your training volume, how that fits in with how much food you eat. Do you have a training day diet, a rest day diet? Like all, there's all these little things that take time. Um, and that's why you see the best bodybuilders usually produce their best results when they've been with a coach for years um, mm -hmm. because you just too. build a, a build a rapport and a center and a synergy with the, the other person. It's not even just the X's and O's of bodybuilding. It's knowing, you know, knowing that client so well, because you've had them for three years and you know what an acceptable level of suffering and fatigue is for them. And then you can pick up on in their check-ins, you know, that they're suffering even beyond, anything that we've ever seen. And it's like, Hey, we still have five weeks left. Like I might need to pull this guy out of this for a couple of days or any of these little nuances that come with working with someone one-on-one -on -one, the way that you do with a bodybuilding coach for a long time. Yeah. I think if there's one thing people can take away from this one all together is like nothing bad can happen from working really fucking hard. And that, that means starving. That means doing crazy amounts of cardio because that yeah. crazy could be 45 minutes every day for you. It could be an hour. It could be, it could be two hours. Whatever it, takes. it could be yeah. you're going to the gym two to three times a day. That's Easily. part of what's expected. That's what you signed up for. Yeah. And I think that could mean that could mean morning you wake up at a terrible hour because you yeah. need to get fasted in before your day job so you go and do your fasted cardio and your abs then you get back and do a full weight training session another session on the stairs you go pose in the locker room maybe you tan on the way out and then you go home and tomorrow you're going to do it all again yeah i feel like certain things have just I love gotten... that process dude i can't wait until i'm big so i can prep again like, do you have to do fasted cardio to get in shape? No, but man, for decades, people were doing fasted cardio. And now there's probably like, something to it. If I had to put my money on it yeah. outside of what the research has shown, there's something to it. I think just from, from a psychological standpoint, psychologically is a big part of it. Dopamine driving uh, behavior to first thing in the morning. And then also, at a certain point, like uh, most people, you wind up having to do doubles. So where the, where does the other one go? Like you have to get up and do it in the morning. Yeah. And I just think, man, if, if you had like a time or a, a way to see into the future and you worked your face off and the day before the show, you could say, man, there's not another thing I could have done to be better than I am today on this day. Like it's awesome, dude. It's the best about feeling. A, talk about a life hack to like, be better than everybody take take what you devote to a contest prep and put it towards your career or put it towards any other endeavor you're gonna you'll kill it and everything we've heard so many that's why so many bodybuilders get into uh being in business for themselves it's because they take that same prep mindset and that same discipline that you 
tackle or that applies to year round bodybuilding and they put it towards life. And, you know, Jay Cutler is one of the greatest bodybuilders of all time physique wise, but he's probably the best all time business wise. Yeah, he, uh, he, you can make a case for Jay as the, the greatest bodybuilder that's ever lived period in terms of a big overarching statement like that. Like you've talked about it. You would view him as pretty much the number one ambassador of our sport period. Anyone external. Yeah. He won however many Arnold's he won four Olympias. He's the only person to ever lose the Olympia, then come back and win it. Mm -hmm. He put an end to the greatest reign in the history of bodybuilding. Mm -hmm. He beat guys that went on and had their own like Phil. Um, Man, maybe maybe the best bodybuilder of all time, and a big part of that is carrying over that same work ethic to everything else that he did. So, yeah, um, I think that's a good a good spot to to wrap it up. Um, like Tommy talked about, we have the Facebook group. Tommy and I both offer online coaching. If you're listening to this still an hour in, I'm sure that's something you already that you know. Uh, the links for everything will be below. And for Tommy Styles. I'm Joseph Percher. This was another episode of a thinking man's podcast. And until next time, guys, we are.